Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. We're teaching on the subject of the prevailing word. Looking here in Acts 19, um, verse 18, it says, And many believed and came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. They counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And one of the things we said here was this, in beginning our teaching along this line, was notice that there was a commitment made by the people to get rid of things that were hindrances to their walking with God. They believed, they took all the curious arts, they brought them, got rid of them, and then what happened? So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So we, we uh, started with this premise that in order for the word of God to work in your life, you're going to have to make commitments to the word. It's bobblehead, come on. If you're not going to amen, be a bobblehead. Somebody came in my office the other day and said, is that really a, 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 your bobblehead of you? I said, yep. There's a pastor at Bobblehead. It's a one of a kind. <laughs> I think you can order a, a remake of it for the, the price of $200 or something along those lines. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I wanted to read something to you that my wife, <coughs> my wife shared on Facebook, so I've got to kind of look it up. I didn't have it here, so obviously it's not in my notes. Everybody say glory. I see Facebook can come in handy. Uh, a pastor named Colin Smith, or Colin Smith, says, I'm ser in serving as a pastor for over 30 years, I've seen some remarkable transformations, and I've seen some big disappointments. I have two observations. First, where there has been a lasting change, the common factor in every case is that the Word of God has had a significant entrance into a person's life. Second, where godly change has failed to get started or has slowly unraveled, the common factor in every case is that change has been attempted without significant engagement in the scriptures. Success comes, success or lack of success comes in relationship to the word of God in your life. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may make your way prosperous, and you shall have good success. Or as one translation says, you'll deal wisely in the affairs of life. Amen? So the, the import of the word, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Amen? Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, not your spirit. See, when, John, when James said that in, in James chapter 1, he's not getting people saved by saying receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. He said your suke, he did not say anything about your pneuma. Suke is in reference, suke is in reference to the soul of man. Sozo, experience a sozo or a restoration of the soul. So we've been receiving the Word of God, importing the Word of God, acting on the Word of God, living in accordance with the Word of God, it de determines your success. Amen. Now I've seen people come and go, and I, and I, I had to kind of like, I mean, in 30 years of pastoring, 30 plus years of pastoring, I've seen the same thing. Those who come in and, and want to use another method other than the Word of God, I guess I should say pastoring and assistant pastoring, because we were in their church until 1987, all right, so uh, 20 plus years of pastoring, seven years or so of assistant pastoring, you've seen it, the same thing, over and over and over and over again. People who take the Word of God, get a hold of the Word of God, act on the Word of God, live the Word of God, put the Word of God in them, their lives are successful. Those who come in and want to kind of copy the confessions, do what everybody else is doing, but not put the Word in, act the act, have the form of godliness but denying the power thereof do not succeed in the long run as a matter of fact <clears throat> a lot of times they can talk a good talk for a season and then eventually i said then eventually they start to unravel they'll come along and all of a sudden they you know they they want a different method to make them successful they want something better to make them there's nothing better than the word i said there's nothing better than the word amen the Word of God is your daily bread. 
Amen. You know, Jesus taught them to pray, give us our daily bread. The daily bread for the believer is his word. I said his word. I, you know, I've loved thy precepts more than my necessary food. Glory to God. You know, the, psalm, the 119th Psalm is full of good stuff. So we, we've talked along the lines of, you know, um, the, the importance of the word. Jesus is the personification of the word, our attitude towards the word. We should reverence the word. We should not have it as a luxury, but it's a necessity. The word is a necessity. Water is not a luxury. Water is a necessity. Hello. You can have all the dry food you want, but if you don't have water, you're going to die. The word is a necessity in your life. And they talked about how the word and the spirit work together. The Holy Ghost does not show up and pull a whole new sh song and dance and does something different outside the word of God. <clears throat> Woo, I felt something. Oh, that must be God, and it's contrary to the Bible. No, it's not, it's not, that's not the Holy Ghost. The Lord showed me. I'm gonna, I remember the woman we talked about. That I told her she had a pizza dream. The Lord showed her she was going to marry some man in the church and then come to find out she let the cat out of the bag. He was married. Well, the Holy Ghost didn't show you you're going to marry somebody else that's already married. He don't do that. Why? Because the Bible tells us, I am the Lord, I hate divorce. Well, I've been divorced. God loves you. He'll forgive you, but he doesn't, he doesn't encourage or endorse you. Hello. We, I, knew, I knew a pastor. Had a, 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 was having a, they call it, everybody likes to call it an affair. You know, that sounds better. He was in an adulterous relationship with the piano player. Duh, that's a new one in the church world. That never happens. Well, they had a church up in another part of the country. Go ahead and tell them, now divorce your spouse, you divorce your spouse, come up to our church, we will marry you together, and then we'll put you back in the ministry before they ever got divorced. Now, how in the world could that pastor of that church get involved in doing exactly what the Lord didn't want him doing and then call it the Holy Ghost? So the Word and the Spirit always work together. That's how we can judge the manifestation of the Holy Ghost is by what does the Word say. We can go judge it and say, well, that's not the Holy Ghost. Why? It doesn't line up with the Word. Amen? Amen? I did three times. All right, I'll say it again. The Word and the Holy Ghost always work together. Amen. They're in agreement. Yep. Why? Because we know the Godhead walks in ultimate and absolute agreement. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are in such a harmonious relationship that, they're, that they, they combine the Godhead is called God. There is no difference in what the Godhead does. Remember, Jesus said, you know, remember Philip said, show us the Father one time? And J Jesus looked at Philip and said, don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What did he mean by that? He meant we're in such harmonious relationship, anything I do is what he would do. As a matter of fact, I only do it because I saw him do it. And then the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, said will not speak of himself, but he'll, he'll speak of me. He'll teach you whatever I have taught you. Bring you whatever, your remembrance, whatever I have said. The Word and the Spirit always work together. Say the Word and the Spirit always work together. <clears throat> and then we said that the Word of God is the instrument by which our lives come into harmony with God's will. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. Go to the Bible. He's already told you to go witness. I need somebody to lay hands on me and prophesy over me and tell me to go witness. Not Jesus already told you. It's already written down. You don't need a word from somebody. We used to have a guy back in our church in Greenville, uh, John Wilkerson. And, uh, you know, this lady would call him up all, every once in a while and, and say, Brother John, what's the word? Dial a prophet. You can't, there's no such thing as dial a prophet. They had Brother Hagin one time. Was got in the middle of the night, got a phone call, picked up the operators on the other end. Got an emergency phone call for Kenneth E. Hagan. Will you take the call? We thought, well, emergency. Okay, I'll take it. Hey, Brother Hagan, look, we're having an all night prayer meeting. And we, we told the operator it was an emergency. It's really not an emergency. We just want to know if you had a word. He said, I couldn't say what the word was. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> he 
And he would tell it kind of funny. He said, yeah, drop dead. <laughs> Woke me up out of a good sleep. Stubbed my toe on the way to answer on and found out you lied to the operator to get me on there. Now, how are you going? Even if he did have a word, how are you going to receive it? You tell, it, tell the operator a lie to get the See, some people think that he mean, the uh, end justifies the means. It doesn't, not even in spiritual things. Hello? We have to follow. So the word of God and the Holy Ghost don't disagree. You're not going to find different things. And the word of God will bring us into his will. You don't need a prophecy. As a matter of fact, under the new covenant, prophecy should be exhortation, amen, and edification, and confirmation, not directional. What do you mean by that? That if you don't have it in your heart and somebody prophesies of you, you better not act on it. One guy said one time, he said, if someone lays their hands on you and prophesies you're going to go to Africa, you better take them with you. Why? So they can prophesy and tell you when to come back. Because you've got to hear from the Holy Ghost yourself. Thank God when the word is confirmed by the Spirit of God, but you've got to have it in your spirit. They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We're not led by prophets. The Old Testament prophet doesn't operate in the New Testament. Not that manner. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. We believe in the Spirit. We believe that we can be given direction as the, the, word, the word Holy Ghost confirms what's in our heart. What happens if I get a word that I don't have in my heart? Put it on the shelf. Now, it could be God. And when he speaks to your heart, then you can take it and run with it. Amen? Amen. Then it becomes, it becomes if he's, you've got to know it in your heart. I'll tell you right now, when we came to Greensboro, it was so supernatural. It was so Holy Ghost. And then my pastor and Buddy Harrison, and we, we, you know, about three months after we were driving back and forth every weekend, uh, Pastor John said, what are you going to do? I said, well, we're supposed to take the church. Well, when did you find out? I said, I've known since February. Why do you say that? I went walking out, <laughs> you know. Well, Brother Buddy thinks you're supposed to do it. I, see, they had it. And when it, when it got, was the right time to act on it, we all were in agreement. And we knew and we stayed. The reason we stayed is because God sent me, and I don't have any doubts. I didn't have a pizza dream. I didn't wonder. I didn't have somebody tell I think you ought to go to Greenville, Greensboro. I had some people back when we were at Sister Pastor Church say, if you'll go start a church, I'll follow you. I said, if I start a church and be so far away, you won't be able to follow me. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's right. It won't, it won't be anywhere close by. You know, we're not going across the street and start the church. I want to live and not die. Plus, we, we love the church we were in. We love the people. We love the pastor. We're not going to hurt them. You know? Somebody in our church one time told somebody, said, hey, if you start a church, brother, I'll follow you. Well, that's, that's the wrong spirit. We're not, here to, we're not here to build the kingdom. We're not here to hurt it. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but praise God. I had somebody tell somebody in our church one time, come on, get out of that church. We ain't doing nothing. Come help me. They were helping me. See? But everybody gets these goosebumps. Oh, it's, 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 uh, no, we got, we got to follow the word. We have integrity. So we know the will of God by the word of God. And even when, and if it's the Holy Ghost, he's going to walk in harmony with that. Three grunts, two amens, and a holy grunt. I mean, a holy, help me, Jesus. Can I get all those things? Yes. Help me, Lord. All right, praise the Lord. All right, so we know the will of God by the word. We're directed by the word. We're healed and delivered by the word. Now, here's where we are tonight, today. Today and tonight, we're going to finish, if we don't finish all this this morning. Uh, go with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I believe one of the most uh, direct scriptures about the word that there is that gives us clarity in the important, of the importance of the word. Uh, why don't we just read this chapter? I was going to move on down to where I wanted to get to. Let's start. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. How many would say we're living in the last days? Now think about this. Now, now Paul wrote this to Timothy a couple thousand, close to a couple thousand years ago and said that in the last days perilous times will come. It's perilous out there. All right? For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's exactly what it means, homosexual. There, there's, you know, no other way around it. It means exactly what it says, without natural affection. All right? True spakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Have you noticed that anything you can do is all right except be a Christian? Everything in the world is tolerated except a believer. 
If you're a believer, you're not tolerated. You're evil. You're mean. You're a hate speaker. You can't have a personal belief. You've got to accept my perverted lifestyle. You've got to give me a bathroom because I think I'm a woman when I'm a man. But if you're a Christian... You are despised because you're good. Trady, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, seeing that you love them. Make it comfortable for them. Bring them into your churches and have a rock climbing wall and tell them, I'm okay, you're okay, have Barney come up and lead worship. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug. That's not what it said. It said from these people turn away. Well, how, you, you, don't, you don't embrace them. You breach the gospel. You love them with the gospel, but you do not embrace their behavior. Amen. This is where the church is messed. I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It was an Episcopal bumper sticker. It said, God loves everybody. No exceptions. Well, what's going on in the Episcopal church? You know what they meant. Absolutely, God loves everybody. As a matter of fact, God loved the homosexual so much, he sent Jesus to die for him, to take his sin away, so that he could be delivered from his sin and go to heaven. That's how much he loved them. He did not love them in the sense of leaving them where they were. Or the adulterer, or the murderer, or the thief, or, the, or, or anybody else that's in sin. He loved them so much, Jesus came to redeem them. So we get the idea that, that, that love means we get to leave you like you are. No, the love of God demands repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. You gotta make it, you gotta be transformed and changed. That is good preaching. Some of y'all be, should be saying, Amen! Amen. Hallelujah! Where is the handkerchief? All right. Yeah. For of such, uh, for of this sort are the, they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifested unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now, this is Paul writing to Timothy, saying, you've known my doctrine. You've known my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Now, here, I grew up classical Pentecostal. And everybody, and it was, things were going bad for, either were suffering like Job, had Paul's thorn, or like the man born blind. Those were our three catch, those were our three uh, no, um, escape routes from why we weren't delivered. But Paul said this, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Didn't leave him there. Did not fail there. He came out, glory to God. I said the Lord delivered him out of them all, hallelujah. You got people running around, I don't know why the Lord's doing this. He's got a good reason for it. I just don't understand that. And then they, and then they suffer and they never make it out. No, Paul said, I went through all this junk, but out of every one of them, Amen. hallelujah, the Lord delivered me. Glory to God. Thank God. See, if you're walking by faith, you're going to walk out in deliverance. Amen. Some of y'all be running by now. Some of y'all been in a tough place. Hallelujah. Your deliverance is at hand. Hallelujah. He will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted above what you're able. What does that mean? It means that whatever you're dealing with, God knows you got the faith to come out. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Paul got, got, got so excited one time, he began to give a testimony right there, right into the church of Corinth. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. What was that? That was a Paul testimony meeting. See, I grew up, we used to testify like this. I want to thank the Lord that I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Well, we're glad you're saved. We're glad you're sanctified. Let's see if you're Pentecostal holiness. 
Sanctification was a second definite work of grace. Okay? You had to get sanctified. Then you could get filled with the Holy Ghost. But then you had to have the whole church pray for you that you'd hold true to the end. Put the word in, you'll hold true to the end. Oh, the devil's been after me all week. Praise his holy name. Oh, my Lord. Now be like Paul. Look the, look the circumstance straight in the eye. Look those things coming at you straight in the eye and say, now thanks be unto God. Why, Paul? Why are you giving thanks to God who always causes me to triumph? Through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Look at your, look at your circumstance and shout like Paul, glory to God. Have a testimony of victory. Her grandfather preached for us a number of years ago, and you'd ask him, say, Brother Baby, how you doing? I'm shouting the victory. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was always his testimony. I'm shouting the victory. <laughs> Glory to God. We got to start shouting the victory instead of mumbling the defeat. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Paul said, you've known all these things. He said, the Lord delivered me out of them all, and yea, and all. listen, yea, well, that was Paul. Yeah, and all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Don't, don't think there aren't people out there preaching to the churches that are there for one purpose, and that is to deceive the church under the guises of a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but the Word of God says that even Satan himself can manifest as an angel of light. <coughs> I've seen people flock after ministries. I'm not talking about proven ministries. And listen, you still shouldn't flock after a ministry and they become your Holy Ghost or God. We honor, we, you know, we have not many fathers. You have many teachers, but not many fathers. Thank God for our spiritual fathers. But even in that, they're still men. Jesus is the head of the church. But I've seen people follow after people and buy their books and their tapes and all this kind of stuff and then find out a few years later they're homosexual. Had been all along. Preaching in our churches. People coming into churches with doctrines of men and devils. Deceiving and being deceived. And nobody having the gumption to stand up and say, this is not God. Because we got to walk in love. The love of God demands that the shepherds protect the flock. Instead of letting you go into detriment, and we don't say anything against a man of God. What if he's not a man of God? What if he's an emissary of the devil sent to deceive the church? What if his doctrine is, is sent of the devil to deceive the church? And we're standing back going, well, we don't, we got to walk in love. We can't say anything evil. You know, let's just, just deal with the doctrine. What they're preaching is not God. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Where was I? Yeah. This is where, uh, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 14, look what Paul said to Timothy, his young protege, his young protege who was pastoring that church. Listen to the word he gives him in the midst of all this evil stuff going on. He, Paul has a word for him. He says, do this. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and be assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul said, Paul, look at me. Watch my life. Now listen, you know, my, my, I consider Dad Hagen my spiritual father. For 70 years, he walked straight. He preached and lived what he taught year in, year out. People would come, doctors would come, things would come and go, and he stayed steady. He didn't waver. I look at men like him, like Lester Summerall, like C.M. Ward, T.L. Osborne, John Osteen, Demas Shakari. These men walked a walk talked a talk and lived it consistently year after year after year after year. They did not waver. They didn't jump on the new bandwagon of the hottest, newest, latest, greatest. It wasn't, oh, this is cool. This is fresh. We're going to hop on this and run with that. No, they just kept staying steady with what they knew. I remember Brother Summerall um, listened to a minister one time. He preached in 1980, in the fall of 1980 at Rhema Week. And he said this, he said, America will come under the rule of Islam for a season. Folks, we're doing, we're living in it right now. 
This is 1980. I heard him. I was sitting right in the room when he said it. He was preaching about jihad back then. About the coming jihad. He was preaching about it back in 1980. Amen. I'm going to say something he said that was different than all that, though. Oh, well, praise God. Oh, you ever heard Brother Summer's Summer's testimony about how he got into the ministry? He's down in South America. And he had a vision. Had a vision of a Bible and a casket. God said, choose. (laughs) 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 And and listen, I heard him him years later. He actually came to our church in Greenville a couple times. And, and, and we, we would get, get you know, I would sometimes in the radio room, radio ready room with him and Sister Summerall. And something we'd eat afterwards. But I, I remember him saying this. He said, that is as real to me today as it was the day I saw it. Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul and showed him what great things he must suffer. And Paul wrote to the church, says, follow me as I follow the Lord. And Paul wrote to Timothy and said, look. All this mess is going on, deceivers and being deceived. You know, you've watched my life. He says, now you learn, you, you keep fast and hold fast. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. Continuing the things you've learned, knowing where you learned them from. You watched my life. I've lived it. I've walked it out. I've demonstrated it. I haven't veered. I haven't changed. I've stayed the same all along. I've proven that it works. Now, the schmuck comes over here with some, woo, you don't have to do anything. You're under grace. You can live, you can live with your you can live with your, your significant other, and that doesn't matter. You can only have to go to church. You don't have to tithe, you don't have to give. You don't, woo! Let's do a little Ric Flair. Woo! The nature boy, baby. Woo! Y'all remember Ric Flair? <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul said there's evil men, seducers, who wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You keep doing what I've given you. And let me tell you something, folks. There's there's always going to be another new, hot, latest, greatest. When when this this excessive teaching on grace peters out, somebody's going to come on with something else. Now, let me me say this. Now, some of you old word of faith people remember. Back when righteousness was being taught real heavy, a lot of the things that were taught were being the exact same things they're teaching in the excessive grace. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. There's, God loves you. It doesn't matter what you do. You don't lose your standing. On and on and on and on and on and on. They taught that back in the 80s, but under righteousness. They just repackaged it. So something else is going to come along. We have to be word people to where we study the scriptures daily. We've got to be Bereans to see whether those things be so or not. We have to be convinced, convicted, Governed, controlled by the word of God. And we're not moved by something that makes everybody go, woo. A lot of times everybody starts going, woo, you watch out. I like it. Now, listen, I love when people get excited about the word. I don't like it when they get excited about hyperbole. I was reading one of my friends today, Guy Dunning. He said that um, people are going around saying, Jesus is grace. The Bible doesn't call Jesus grace. So for you to call Jesus grace is erroneous. Yeah, but it brings everything under the narrative of the, the, the hyper grace, the, the excessive grace. All right, moving right along. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are, listen, what? The holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now the word salvation, soterius, is going to carry more than just getting born again. It is part of the sozo word group. It is the noun of the sozo verb word group. And it's carrying those meanings of, of being born again, of being healed, of being made whole, of being delivered, of being made sound in the realm of the soul and so forth. So he says here the scriptures make you wise unto soterius. All of those things. Okay? Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even the ones you don't like. Which the one I don't like? The one that goes counterman, that countermands that hottest, newest, latest, greatest you just got. If you don't like what it says, 
that means you're about to change. If you hear somebody teaching something, and then there are scriptures that, that are opposite. Now you got people going around teaching, we don't do anything once we get saved. We can't do anything. The Bible says we're created in the good works. One person said, I don't have to obey. Yet it says, obey those with the rule over you. I don't have to submit. Submit yourselves one to another. Amen. Come on now. Yeah. I don't have to go to church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves to gather as a man or some. Amen. You see? You can't take some new doctrine that something, it's not even doctrine, it's not true doctrine. Some new teaching that someone brings out and run off with it <clears throat> and not take the scripture and judge it. So that the scripture judges what's being said. Why? Because scripture will balance scripture. Not compromise scripture, but balance it. Hello? Now, the doctrine of love. We've got all kinds of people who just want to major on the doctrine of love and never deal with the, the, the doctrine of sin and retribution for sin. God, how can a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. You go there because you reject his love offering. But we don't want to teach about sin and the penalty and retribution for sin. And that if you, are, if you die without Jesus Christ, you're, you go into, uh, you go into to hell. And then you're, you're given up and go into the second death, the lake of fire, which is the second death. And you're eternally separated from God. We want to teach that. Why do we not want to teach that? Because it messes up our love, our love doctrine. We want everybody to feel good. And so we won't teach the whole council. We'll just teach love, 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 love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Jesus talked about hell. He said they'll be cast into outer darkness for there's weeping and dashing of teeth. What does love do? Everything it can to keep you from getting there. It is a false love to pat people on the back and tell them, it's all right, God loves you, you're not going to hell when they're not born again. That your actions don't have consequences. That is not love. It's getting people to like you. There are people who say anything that you want to hear just to get, just so you'll like them. And it's for their own ego. It's not for your betterment. And to preach the love without telling people, to say that God loves you, he, he couldn't send you to hell. It's just so people are like you. Instead of saying God knows that you're destined for hell and he loved you so much he sent Jesus that if you'll believe on him, you won't perish. That's love. All right. All scripture is given by instrument. What time? No, it's not. How many give me five minutes? Five? Ten? I only got ten. Twenty? All right. I gave myself ten. <laughs> got some melon throw up another fifteen. We got twenty-five now. All scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable. Advantageable, the, the definition says, for doctrine. The scriptures are our doctrine. Everybody say, the scriptures are our doctrine. We learn our, 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 our teachings, our, our statements of faith and belief are the scriptures. The word of God is profitable to you for doctrine. Meaning, you need to know your doctrine. You need to know what the Bible says. You don't need to know what Pastor Ed told you the Bible says. You don't need what television preacher says the Bible says. You need to know what the Bible says. We're here to inspire you. We're here to guide you. We're here to lead you. We're here to show you things. But you've got to be a Berean and run. Remember, remember what Paul said? I mean, the book of Acts said, said that when they went to, to, to Berea and preached, he said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so or not. Now, I love these people who say that if we could just get rid of the Old Testament, we'd be all right. What scriptures do you think they were searching daily? 
Hello? I mean, we got, we got a big, famous preacher right now who said if we, could just get, if we could just get rid of the Old Testament for everybody, we'd be all right. Really? <clears throat> so when Paul was preaching, if we could have just gotten rid of the Old Testament where they were going to go search and find out if it was so or not, we'd been all right. See, people say stuff that's just not scriptural. No, the, the, the Bible, the scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, we'll, we'll cover later. I actually run over to 1 Peter. Hold your place right here. Take your little thing like this. Stick it in your Bible. We don't have one that does it on, up there. But anyway, now I just want you to know, remember, remember about a year or so ago, we, uh, we, we stopped putting the scriptures up on the wall because we want you to bring your Bible. Pastor John's getting ready to do that this fall. They're going to take and not going to put the scriptures up anymore. We might join him. It's good to bring your Bible and mark in it. You need a marked up, torn up Bible. Hello? Now I've got to figure out what this goes back at. Let's see. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where's James? James. Peter. There's Peter. It's so. Maybe it's 2 Peter. Okay, 2 Peter. Verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking them of things, of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, that they which are unlearned and unstable rest, that means to twist, as they do also the other scriptures. Peter, who had apostolic authority in the church, recognized Paul's writings as scripture. Okay? Unto their own destruction. So, we know that Paul said that they, they looked in the old covenant. They were looking in the old covenant. So the old covenant is scripture. Peter, with apostolic authority, recognized Paul's writings as scripture. Okay? He had apostolic authority. He's one of the, I mean, he's one, of the, he's one of the top three. Amen? Jesus had 70, he had 12, he had three, and he had one. All right, the seven, he had the 12 disciples we all know about. Then Peter, Peter, James, and John, and then out of that, he had John. Yeah. You know, you got, you got southern gospel groups that sing about John the Revelator. Yeah, there you go, that's it. All right. The scripture is given. God gave us the Bible. Even the one, the scriptures you don't like. Their doctrine. I said their doctrine. So that means that we as, the, as a believer have to adjust ourselves to what the Bible says. And not pick, let me say this. This is not an all you can eat, pick what you want buffet bar. This is mama sitting down and saying, eat your greens. I don't like them greens. You're going to eat them anyway. They're good for you. I don't like submit yourself one to another. I like, you know, I'm under grace. You got to take the submit yourself with the grace too. Amen. It's how it works. The whole counsel of the word of God. You see, if you want to be successful as a believer, you've got to let the word of God work in you. You can't take what you like and live according to what you like because you're leaving something vital out. Amen. Brother Randy Greer, you know, has been to our church a few times, and um, he said that he was in prison, that when they, got, when they got contraband, you know, candy and cigarettes and all this kind of stuff, they called them Zuzus and Wham Whams. And everybody wanted Zuzus and Wham Whams. We got a church full of folks who want Zuzus and Wham Whams. We want all the contraband. We want all the stuff that makes us feel good. We want all the things that, that, that tickle our ears. We want all the things that, that woo, over. And we don't want the things that tell us to be diligent. To add to our faith brotherly kindness, when Peter writes to the church, and to our faith virtue. See, the word of God is, pro all scripture is profitable as for doctrine. We have to live in the full counsel of the doctrine of God, not just in a little bit here and a little bit there. 
If we're going to be successful, if we're going to grow, if we're going to mature, if we're going to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, then we're going to have to say the word of God is doctrine to me and I take the whole counsel. And when it goes where you don't like it, you still got to go there. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Then it says this. It's good, it's good for doctrine. It's good for reproof. One famous preacher came to America and got in Texas about a month ago, stood up in a coliseum of about 70,000 people and said, if anybody preaches that God is judging anybody, it's an American preacher lie. God doesn't judge anybody. Really? Go check with Ananias and Sapphire and tell me how that went for them. Y'all remember that, don't you? I mean, right out the gate, they come walking in and lie to the Holy Ghost and fall over dead. Right in church. See, we want God to judge San Francisco when he's got to start at the house of God first. Now, Brother Summer also said this. He said, before the return of the Lord, we'll see the days of Ananias and Sapphire in the church again. That went over big. Well, I don't believe in the judgment of God. Well, honey, let me tell you something. If God's going to judge the world, he's going to have to judge his people first. Because you can't accuse God of being favorites and letting his people do what he won't let them, the world, do. Jesus is coming soon. I've heard that all my life. He's coming soon. Let me say it this, this way. What you heard 30 years ago, you're 30 years closer to it. <laughs> He's coming back. Now, see, I, I remember when I first got saved, I wasn't even going to get married. Because Jesus would be back before I could even get married. Had a bunch of guys at Raymond running around before I got there called the Burr Club. Bachelors until rapture. They're all married with kids. Hallelujah. Dad Hagen used to say, live like he's coming back any second. Plan like he's not coming back for 50 years. See, what do you mean live? Live holy. Live right. Live like the, the Lord's going to walk in any second. Make sure your life, your life lines up with him. But make your plans like it's going to be 50 years. Go ahead and plan on the ministry. Go ahead and plan on doing what God. Go ahead and plan on having a family. Go ahead and make your plans for your life. But live. Keep your lifestyle in a way. See, that's good doctrine. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Amen? Be holy even as I am holy, says the Lord. I don't know how some of these people can say they're under grace and go to the scripture that says, be holy if I am holy and live like the devil. When the Bible says live holy. Now, I ain't talking about Pentecostal holiness. I ain't talking about the beehive hairdo and the, and the dust and powder on the face and the burlap sacks for dresses. It always amazed me. The man could walk in with white pants, white shoes, a Kelly green jacket, and a pink shirt, and a red feather in his hat, and that was okay. But the woman had to look like death, warmed over three times. And in a white Pentecostal church, they put that white dust and powder on their face. You know? It's not like just came from the funeral home. Just got my casket tried out. Any old, old white women remember that dust and powder? Did you, you didn't wear white white dust and powder, did you? Oh, she took care of white folks and put it on them. <laughs> they looked like death warmed over, didn't they? Yes, they did. <laughs> Mama, you're like you're about to die. That's not holiness. Holiness starts in the heart. It's a way you live. It's, a, it's an attitude. The Bible teaches whole, living holy separated from the things of the world. didn't say don't go into the world and preach. It said be separate from the world. You don't have to live like the world to win the world. You don't have to shoot up to win a heroin addict. Let me say this. You don't have to be an ex-prostitute to go win prostitutes. You don't have to be an ex-convict to win uh, prisoners. What do you got to be? Anointed. Live a holy life. Be anointed. You can win it. Je Jesus didn't know what it was like to do some of the stuff he was preaching, uh, any of the stuff he was to doing, uh, ministering to people that did. He didn't, know anything, he didn't know anything about doing any of the things they did. He was anointed to minister to them. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke, not your, not, not your common in <laughs> commonality. Commonality? Is that the right word? Commonality? Thank you. I was getting ready to make up a word. 
I do that often. I have my doctorate in neology. I'm a neologian. He who makes up new words. For reproof, God's word will reprove what you believe and how you act. It will tell you you are wrong. Did y'all, brother, did you get all the guns and the rocks and stuff before they came in this morning? All they saw. If you've got one, please hold it till afterwards. Yet the Word of God will do that. The Word of God will work in you to prove, listen, actually, this, kind, this word kind of goes along this line, to prove to you what's right. The Word of God will. Now, I've said this. You know, a lot of times we go to people, we go to people in the world for counsel, and they give you some Freudian, worldly, psychological, goobity gawk when the Bible says do something different. Well, you should never spank your child. You'll break their spirit. Well, the Bible says if you don't, you hate them. It says if you spare the rod. How many you know the old country saying? Spare the rod, spoil the child. The Bible literally says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. It says the rod of correction drives rebellion from the heart. That's what the Bible says. I just want you to know, Pastor, I'm going to come in your church, but I don't spank my children. Well, just so you'll know, I'm going to preach about that you should. Because you're walking outside the counsel of the Word of God. And I'll prove it to you from the Bible. I'll reproof you. The Word of God will reproof you, reprove you, and bring reproof. Because you're saying, I don't believe it, and the Bible says you better. Or you're going to have that monster on your hands. And ain't nobody going to want to be around you. And then they're going to be rebellious and they're going to grow up and do what they want to do and tell you to take a hike and you won't be able to control them because you didn't put some discipline on their seat of correction when they were younger. You're teaching child abuse. Oh, shut up. These psychological goobity gop. Your child should be your friend. No, they're your child. You're to train them up in the way of the Lord. They're not your buddy at six. Not your pal. They're your charge to train in the way of righteousness. The Word of God teaches us that. So you have an obligation as a Christian parent to train your children up in the way of the Lord. That means that you're going to have to spank them. But they cry so hard. That's okay. They'll get over it. <laughs> yeah, Nathan did. My kids... They hated it. We said, let's go, kids, and we drive up to the paint store. Because they knew we were going in and getting the five-gallon paint stirrers. Nathan, Nathan got those sides. I just had to take two of them and tape them together. Yeah. I melted them down, too, didn't I? Shapow! <laughs> Oh, here comes the, the, the federal government to arrest me for child abuse. He, he's alive. He's not messed up. Listen, I know, I, I have relatives that used to take tobacco sticks and beat their kids. You get about 18, 17 or 18, think they, think they knew something? They pop off with the dad, he, he, he'd have a tobacco stick in his hand and go, wham! Tobacco sticks about this long, about an inch square, made out of a fire-killed oak. Because they hung them in barns to hang tobacco on. That, that, end, that end of the discussion. <laughs> You're going to respect me. <laughs> that was abuse. Most of the time that kept them from going down the wrong path. Well, we, got, we got prisons full of, you know, psychologists and counselors trying to help people who grew up and were misunderstood who went out and killed 40 people. And they're just misunderstood. Now, the Bible says if you, if you bring the rod of correction against them, you'll drive rebellion out of their heart. That's what the Bible says. That was the most enthusiastic part of preaching I've ever had responding from this church. Thank you for supporting me here. 
Amen. Now, see, the Word of God brings a reproof, brings a, brings a way in your life where it shows you where you're wrong if you'll do what the Scripture says. And then you adjust and line up with the Word of God. It's profitable for you to do that. It's profitable to, be, to let the Word of God take what you think it, what you, you can, how you can live and what you should do and tell you that's not right. You've got to live this way and do it this way. That's profitable to you. Everybody says it's profitable. And we're going to have to stop here. I can't get the correction and instruction of righteousness right now. It'll take us too long because y'all didn't give me but 20 minutes. I ten of them I gave myself. See, I thought Emily was going to get in on it. She didn't join because Nathan told her not to. Hello? So the, the, the Word of God is profitable. All Scripture is given by God and is profitable. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Can I tell you something? This may be, a heavy, this may be the heaviest revelation you've ever had in your life. You don't know squat. All the things you think you know until they've been measured against the Word of God and judged by the Word of God and corrected and shaped by the Word of God, you don't know squat. Well, I thought I was pretty, I got, a, I got a bunch of letters behind my name. Like Dad Agan said one time, he finally figured out that PhD meant post hole digger because a post hole digger had more sense than that. Now, that's not always, I understand. Brother Bill's got a PhD, all right? I could say I'm PhD, ABD, all but dissertation, all right? I, I, I can say that, but you know what? It's not the education. It is the Word of God changing how you think, changing what you do, adjusting how you live, and it's, your profit, it's to your profit. That's old-fashioned. Don't listen to the people say it's old-fashioned. That's the same bunch that's saying... It's all right for homosexuals to get married. And now a judge just came out and, and said this week in a ruling, it's not a ruling, he said in, a, in an opinion about a ruling. He said uh, he thinks that really incest may lose its, its place as a taboo. Oh. It's going down that slope. I said it's going down that slope. Why? Because the wisdom of men, the wisdom of this world is first earthly, sensual, and devilish. And we've opened that door up in our country. We elected a president who openly said, I'm for homosexual marriage. He openly said it before the last election. First election, he didn't say it. Second one, he did. Openly said it. And was still reelected. And hell has unleashed all this on our country. Homosexual stuff's going all over the place. Judges are ruling all over the place. Their laws are being passed in state legislatures to say you can't do it. And some federal wimpy judge goes, yes, you, got, you, can't pat, you can't do that. I say you can't because I'm a judge. Now, I rule it unconstitutional. Now we're going to say, they're going to start saying incest is okay. Next, pedophilia is okay. It's all coming. Why? Because people are not renewing their mind to the word of God and letting the word of God prevail in them. So that they're doers of the word, they're living according to the word, and they're having doctrine and reproof take place through the word in their life. You say, amen, oh me, or help me, Jesus, but it's true. Well, I don't like that. I can't help it. It's still true. Stand up. <clears throat> See, it's more fun when we quit on the part where you can now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. That's more fun, isn't it? <laughs> Pastor, I wish you would let us go home on that one. Well, see, I got, I got you inspired now. I gave you the stuff to go chew on. Amen? What do we do? We let you have your ice cream first. <laughs> yeah. Your chocolate cover Sunday first. Follow me, bless the people. We thank you that your word is true and works in their lives. We thank you for the Holy Spirit of God, the teacher of the church, moving upon each and every person here, taking the things said by the Holy Ghost through the word of God, piercing into their hearts, dealing with them, striving with them to bring them into harmony with the will and purpose and mind of God. We thank you that there's a great work taking place in them. 
and that that transformation that does take place because of it will be marvelous and wonderful, will be notable among men around them. And we'll see the transforming work of the Word of God in their lives as the Holy Spirit orchestrates and works with them. In Jesus' mighty name. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.